This is the first of the four in a series that I'm speaking on, on behalf of the Christmas of 2022. And it comes from our study out of Genesis 2, 18 through 25. If you ever are thinking about getting married as a young person, you should really read this and pay attention to it. Because this is the origin of marriage and the incomplete instructions on not only your wedding ceremony, but your marriage, in fact. This is our second study on, second, on, on Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Last week, we introduced this scripture to you on the origin of marriage. And I'm going to come back this week with it as the first in a series of lessons on Christmas. After many, many years in the ministry, observing a lot of stuff involved in engagements, courtships, marriages, stability in marriages, instability in marriages. I've observed for the last 20 years three things that we should be aware of. Now, you probably are because they probably are going on in your family. Maybe not your personal family, but in the circle of your family of influence, uh, at least as deep as your cousins. And let's see if any of this relates to you. For example, I've discovered that many believers do not know the origin of marriage. They don't know where in the Bible they can read about the origin of marriage. Everybody knows that, you know, marriage is a, they think it's a human institute. The truth of the matter is it's a divine institute. Thanks, Willie. Marriage is a divine institute for humans, not vice versa. In Genesis, the second chapter, 18 through 25, it is listed that way. And here's what the young people conclude. Because they don't understand the origin and that the origin of marriage is for the human race. And as long as the human race exists, marriage as, as part of that program is there. You say, yeah, but it was in Genesis. It doesn't matter. Marriage is for the entire period of human history. If you're, if you're interested in the end of time, you're talking about the second coming of Christ. Marriage started before, it was introduced before mankind, and it goes entirely through the whole system of the human race. And I meet young people in the 21st century who don't think that what the Bible has to say about marriage is relevant. They don't think it's relevant. And that's pretty appalling to me. They, and listen, as a result of that, they don't have anything, they don't have a guide to go by in their courtship, in their dating, in their marriage, or after they get married. And as a result, they have chaotic courtships, they have chaotic marriages, and they all wind up all, all wind up in a mess when they don't have a, a biblical guidance. Who should I date? How should I date? Who should I marry? How should I be married? I mean, people get married today like owning an automobile with spare tires. I mean, you marry, listen, the set of tires you have when you get married, you gotta, they last the whole marriage. You can't, you, can't, you can't change your, your wife like you can tires. They say, well, you know, they're getting old. Mm -hmm. They're getting worn out. Mm -hmm. They don't have the air in them anymore. Mm -hmm. Listen, he talks about a spare rib, but not a spare tire. When he talks about a wife, he talks about a, Spare rib. He never talks about a spare tire. Right? You just get an old tire anywhere. And it's true, you can, but that's not what you're supposed to do. That's not what you're supposed to do. Here's another thing I've discovered. I've discovered that many believers don't know or believe marriage is a divine institution for man. 
They don't have a clue. They get married and don't have a clue. They don't know what the Bible says. They don't really think it's relevant. They don't really care. And they get married and then they got problems. Welcome to the real world. They live like unbelievers. In fact, I've seen unbelievers have more happiness in marriages than I've seen many Christians. Now, there's something wrong with that picture. When unbelievers can be more happy in marriage than believers, something wrong with that picture. It is marriage that God compares to believers they get married to. We're the bride, and Christ is the groom. I mean, how, 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 is that, how is this possible? Many believers don't know or don't care that they should marry only believers. And I gave you scripture. You, listen, and listen. If you're dating somebody, and you get where you really like them, you should know whether or not they're a believer because if they're not a believer, you better leave them to Christ or leave them alone. Because you're told not to marry unbelievers. I'm appalled at how many people don't know the Bible talks about that. So I wrote it down in the scripture so you could have some evidence of this. I wrote 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through the 7th chapter, verse 2. I wrote the 7th chapter, 39, 7, 39, and the ninth chapter, verse 5, and 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16 on your paper. I hope you go home and read that. Okay. I know when you go to high school that dating is a popular sport. I mean, I know that. And I'm not saying you shouldn't date somebody that, you know... You, but if you get where you, quote, like them, you say, well, I don't expect to get married. Yeah, there may be a lot of causes for you to get married you didn't expect. How about that? Listen, your dating pattern has a lot to do with your marital pattern because it involves romance and love. If you're a jerk there, you'll be a jerk over here. If you're a jerk there, you'll be a jerk here. I mean, how is it? How is it possible that you've never read this stuff, yet you want to get involved in a dating game? Or And listen, I don't care how old you are, it applies to you. I, you know, I have people, I'm 70 years old. <laughs> I, I've, I've been married. I've got grandkids. I don't think I've got it. Listen, the same rules apply to you at any age. It's because you're older don't mean you're... Listen, I meet a lot of people older, not smarter. Listen, wisdom comes from God. It comes from the Word of God. You're not, a, you're, no more, you're not any more smarter than the information you have from the Word of God. So you ought to read these things. You ought to read these things. You shouldn't be dating without them. You ought to read this stuff. The last time we gathered, we learned that there were three different teachers. In, and listen, in Genesis 2, 18 through 25, now the casual reader, because they are casual, they don't get anything. Be more specific when you read the Word of God. There are three teachers speaking in Genesis 2, 18 through 25. There are three speakers. The Lord God has a section where he talks about Adam has a section where he talks about it. And Moses has a section that he talks about it. You should pay attention to that when you read it. And so I outlined it for you. I outlined it for you. Because what God had to say was important before your wedding. And what Adam said was important while he was marrying, at wedding, during the wedding. And Moses was after the wedding. You should pay attention to that. What's important in my life before I get married? What is the importance in getting married? And what's the importance afterwards? All of that's in Genesis. You cannot be a casual reader in the Word of God and expect to grow and have wisdom. 
You've got to study the Bible, dear hearts. You've got to study the Bible. You should get you a good Bible. If you're going to make an investment, make a good investment. Get a, at least get a new, new, new American standard. Get, get one that's got a commentary with it. Maybe Rye Reeves or somebody like that. And pay attention. The first thing you should do is, is look how the Bible, what all the Bible has. What all the book has. It has contents. It has a concordance. It has maps. First thing you ought to be familiar with how it's structured. I mean, if you buy a car, do you not look at do you not look the car all over? I mean, you don't say buy it buy it the way it looks. It's a shiny car, and so I'm going to buy it. I mean, you're going to you're going to give it a re test run, aren't you? Then you're going to try to take it to somebody who knows better. You got an uncle who's a mechanic. You're going to have him look it over. You're going to look it over. You should do that with your Bible. Then start reading it. We also learned from last week that both Jesus and Paul taught on the scriptural origin of marriage of Genesis 2, 18 through 25. In other words, some people thought, I don't think it's relevant. Jesus thought it was relevant. He taught on it. In, in, Matthew, in Matthew, the 19th chapter, in fact, in verse 6 of Matthew 19, he added a newology. He added something to it that is not found in Genesis. The second chapter, 18 through 25. Wouldn't that be of interest to you? Wouldn't it be in interesting that Jesus, when he talked about Matthew, uh, Genesis 2, 18 through 25, that he added a newology, he added something unique about it that would be important for you to know when you read it? Well, you will find that. I'm not going to tell you. You will find it. If you're not interested, that's, that's up to you. It's found in Matthew 19, 6, though. You should pay attention to that. Paul writes about it. Paul writes about it. And last week, we talked about all this. We talked about how Paul, how Paul is talking about Christ in the church in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. And you think he's talking about marriage until you get to the last three verses. And he says, ah, I know, you thought I was talking about marriage. I was talking about the church. You know, wives love, love your... Uh, husbands love your wives, wives be submissive, all that. He said, be, and why? Well, because Christ in the church is all about marriage. Christ in the church. And he says, listen, some of you that are married don't understand the importance of it to God. God compared his son and the church. And how was the church bought? How was the church bought? You say, well, it's, with some money, some people got to get it bought. No, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the flesh and blood church. How was it bought? Listen, Acts 20, 28. It was bought by the blood of Christ. The church of Jesus Christ was bought. What, you, well, sure, why? Because the church is made up of individuals like you. The blood of Christ. Well, let me talk about a few things this morning. Let me talk about a few things. It is interesting that in the Lord God section, eight, which is the second chapter of Genesis 18 through 22, and not in the Adam section or in the Moses section, that God declared that it was not good for man to be alone. Adam didn't come up with this. Well, <laughs> Adam didn't come up with that idea. Adam didn't come up with the idea of getting married. Adam didn't kind of get up with the idea that he was a, a, a alone. He didn't. God came up with that. You're not going to find it in the Adam section. You're going to find it in the God section. It was the Lord God who declared that Adam needed a suitable helper or a soulmate. I wrote it in the Hebrew, a corresponding co counterpart. That word... Suitable helper means a, in Hebrew, means a corresponding counterpart. You know what that means? It means Genesis 1, 26, 27. You should write that down if you don't know it. Now, if you've got it memorized, God bless you. You know what that says? That God made man uniquely different than all the animals. All the animals he made were called species. But he made man... Mankind unique. 
He made him in the image according to the likeness of God. That's Genesis 26, 27. Genesis 1, 26, 27. And when he says what Adam needs is a counterpart, he's not talking about a new, a new poodle. What you need, what, what your wife needs is a poodle. What your wife needs is a new cat. Because I'm afraid we've made terrible substitutes in our life from the animal kingdom. My best friend. It better not be Philo, Fido unless he's 6'2 and weighs 200 pounds and is just a handsome hunk. You know what I mean? He better not bark all the time and uh, look for hydrants. You've got to be understanding about this. And it's really interesting. Do you know when you read Genesis 2, 18 through 25? Because I know you don't, but I'm telling you, I'm trying to encourage you to do that. Do you know that in the middle of a discussion on marriage, he stops and has a discussion on house pets? <laughs> you should read verses 19 and 20. It's right in the middle of it. He stops and goes like, and I'm not talking about substituting animals. Hey, we're so crazy. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a pet. It should be your best friend. My, 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 your, your dog shouldn't be your best friend. Unless he's bringing meat home for you every night. You had cat to brought meat home for you every night, would you eat it? The stuff they come to the door and drop off? I don't think so. A pet is a pet. It's not designed to be a soulmate. It's not designed to be a side. I don't make it one. Don't change a dog into a man or a woman. My, my, my. I shouldn't have to tell you all this stuff, but I, I figure I do because it's in the Bible. Right in the middle of this great origin passage, Verse nine, you have verse 19 and 20, and he talks about pets. He talks about the animal kingdom. He talks about species. I said species, <laughs> in case you were. It's also interesting to me that he pauses and he teaches about the household pet. He does it in verse 19 and 20. God, not, God never intended for man's best companion in life to come from the animal kingdom. Always keep them as a species. You can have a dog. You can have a cat. You can have a bird. You can have a fish. You can have all these things. But they're not your soulmate. They were never intended to be. Listen, the next person comes by and feeds them better than you, they're gone. Huh? <laughs> I know your dog would never leave you. <laughs> I know. Animals were never intended to replace the Lord God or the suitable helper or the soulmate. That has to be made for it to be a suitable helper has to be made in the image according to the likeness of God. The animal kingdom was intended to show man like he did Adam, the animal kingdom was intended to show man, like he did Adam, his need for true companionship of soulmates. Adam began to name all the animals and he found them paired up, like Noah did when he put them on the ark. Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe. Anyway, isn't that interesting? God did that. Isn't that interesting what God did? You can read it out of Genesis 6, 18 through 22, but you're familiar because probably if you've been in Sunday school, you've heard about Noah's Ark and the animals coming by pairs. Jesus in Matthew, the 20, in the sixth chapter of Matthew, verse 26, he talks about the birds. 
He said you can use them. Birds can teach you lessons. But you don't marry them. I've told you often about my mother's bird. I won't go back to that bird, but that bird had the nastiest mouth. I don't know. Somebody, somebody was teaching him. But you want to read about that. And when you read Matthew, the sixth chapter of Matthew, verses 25 through 34, listen to this. There's a marker. Write this down, and someday, when you're not bored with my class, read it. Because the marker is the word worry. You ever, you, ever, you ever been worried about anything? Well, I'm worried I can't make the team. Well, I'm worried I can't get a date. I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. You ever heard that? Huh? Huh? Do you know that the word worry is used in verse 25, 27, 28, 31, and 34? And he, and he explains what he means by worry. Are you worried about life things? You shouldn't be if you've got the source of life. You see, God is the source of life. Things aren't the source of life. They come from the source of life. Things are things that God gives you. They're not the source of, they shouldn't be the source of life for you. They shouldn't be the source of happiness for you. Things, we call them details of life, are not your source of happiness. Did you know that? We well, should read Matthew, the sixth chapter. It's a wonderful chapter, and, and pay attention to what the point of it is. The point is what he keeps repeating. Stop worrying about the things of this life. You're worrying about all the wrong things, he says. And so you should, in my opinion, you should, you should, you should read this about getting caught up in the cares of the world. Let me make one more point. I'll let, I'll let, we'll take a break. There's a difference between being alone, that's a physical idea, and being lonely, which is an emotional idea. When he says it's not good for man to be alone, he didn't use the word lonely. He meant alone. I'm going to give him a suitable helper. I'm going to give him a corresponding soulmate. Somebody that's made in the image according to the likeness of God that they can have compatibility with the source of life. Isn't that wonderful? Listen, he has that for every one of us. Don't settle for less. Don't settle for less. There's a difference between being alone and being lonely. And here's something interesting. God saw the need in Adam before Adam saw the need. In fact, God had to explain to Adam a need before Adam realized he had one. <laughs> now, the girls know this. They know how slow we are sometimes. The girls pick that up right away, and guys are a little slow with it. Yeah. Single solitude is a time to become spiritually one in a relationship with God. You'll never have a better time in your life than single solitude to build a relationship between you and God. Let me tell you, holy mackerel, you get married, now you got, got another, yeah, oh, yeah. And you, you wonder, where was all my time going? Where is, I, I used to have time to, nah, nah, nah. and then all of a sudden you get kids. And then uh, I used to have that, nah, nah. then you, there's no better time to build a relationship with God than when you're alone. You know, and listen, let me tell you something. You know what God calls that? Listen to me, now you're going to miss this. You know what he calls that? Now listen to me. He calls it first love. That's what God calls it. First love. Calls it first love. 
It should be the first love of your life. If you're a believer and a teenager especially, oh my goodness, or, or, or single. If you're still single after you hit, get out of teen years, more power to you. But look, this is, a time to build a, this is a time to build the first love. Listen to me. A love relationship between you and God is called the first love. Listen to me now. And that's the love you take and give to your soulmate. And she flourishes with it. The greatest gift you can give your soulmate is God's love. Flesh to flesh. The two becoming one. You need to be prepared to give your wife first love. If you've been married a while, you need to stop and reevaluate and give your wife first love, not last. First, first love. The love that you have with God, unconditional love that you have with God is to be transferred to her and she doesn't have to beg for it, write for it. She ought to have so much of it that she's stacking it in a closet. She shouldn't be starved to death for it. She shouldn't be starved to death for it. And she shouldn't, you should be able to give it to her without expecting anything back in return. You should give her that first love that's all about grace. You know, I hear people talk a lot about grace, and, and I like that. But it needs to show up in your life. It needs to show up in your life the way you treat one another. And gentlemen, it's your responsibility. It is our responsibility to give our wife first love. And I'm going to tell you, God tells you that she'll, she'll flourish on it. And it's what sets you apart and unique from all the other hunks in the world. Well, let's have a word of prayer. We'll take a short break, and the gentleman will go downstairs, and we'll finish this. Maybe. If not, we'll, I'll see you next Sunday with it. I want to give Jackie all that she needs, the second half, to hear a great mission report. Uh, if you followed her and her team over in the Philippines, you will be thrilled to death to hear this report. So, our Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for the offering that we're about to take. I pray, Father, that we will be good stewards, spend a little on ourselves and most on the kingdom so that we can spread the gospel as far ends to the ends of the earth. Reach Moody. We're excited, Father, to, to be part of the Shepherd Center service ministry. There are people, it's, it's unexcusable to have 40 elderly families out here without food or 48 families that are not able to feed their children adequately. And especially when they're not school age, where they can get a meal. So Father, help us to be sensitive to the needs in Moody. May we be the first responders to it. We should be. We are the church of Jesus Christ.